My name is Pedro Reis, and I'm here today with you to show you um, from Power BI to Excel the best of the two worlds. So I hope you have some fun while watching this, and I believe this will be a topic that will be increasingly uh, important with some of the new features that are going to come uh, very soon. All right, so welcome everyone. So the session from Power BI to Excel, the best of the two worlds. All right. So let me tell you guys uh, a little bit about the objectives for our um, for our session today. What I want to do with you guys today is first to tell you a story about Excel Power BI and the evolution of these tools. You will see where we're leading with this. I want to show you that you can use not only Power BI, the tool of the moment for analytics and Excel, but also an Excel to analyze the uh, data sets that are stored in Power BI and hence in, uh, in uh, Azure. I want to demonstrate how you can do it in Excel and why do, should you do it in Excel on some of the cases. That's the purpose that we're going to do today. I want to also show you some ideas and techniques using multidimensional expressions so that you can manipulate data uh, in a single cell as you please. You can get anything you want in a single cell. And maybe even, you know, turn you guys into a super user of these two amazing tools together for analytics. So I believe this presentation can be useful, especially for two uh, types of profiles. One of them is the business user or the business analyst who wants to have, you know, more flexibility analyzing data, Power BI data, uh, data sets in, in, in Excel, and learning how to leverage them together. Um, other type of profile is the IT professional, you know, who wants to give good options for people to use the data that they work with, that they do the good performance, that they uh, work on the governance for the users from the data sets that they manage. So I believe at least these two profiles, I think this session will be interesting and a couple of other profiles too. About me, I am, uh, my name is Pedro Reis. I come from Portugal. I am team leader at Natixis, which is investment bank of PPCE, one of the largest European and French banks. Uh, I work with a uh, BI with big data and uh, software development teams, multiple um, multiple uh, uh, teams and multiple projects. Um, I am MCSA and BI reporting. Uh, I also have a specialization in supply chain from MIT. I worked, you know, I came more from the business uh, scenario. I was a business user. Then I worked as a business analyst. Then I went a little bit more technical um, as a business intelligence solution architect. As a consultant, I also collaborate with the university for some lectures. And I'm the co-founder of the uh, Porto Power BI user group, Power BI Portugal uh, group. I'm one of the leaders and we host meetups every month uh, for two years and a half consecutive. We have a meetup every month. Most of them are in English. If you guys are curious at some time, please search us on the meetup platform and drop by. And uh, whenever I can, I try to be at this kind of events. I believe it's really as important to know things as to share them with other people. And together, we can really be a community in the Microsoft stack with Power BI, with Azure, with all the ecosystem of the Microsoft 365. So I'm a regular speaker when I can. SQL Saturday, the former one, the new Data Saturday, Power Platform World Tour, Global Power Platform World Tour, and now uh, Global Azure uh, Two. In other boot camps, you can find some of my sessions at sessionize slash Pedro uh, Reis. Let me tell you guys a story. Uh, I want to, why do I bring for an Azure session a topic about uh, Excel? You understand how this story comes all together, but you need to understand why is really, when we are talking about state of the art tools and uh, a lot of things you can do in Azure, why is still Excel so popular? Knowing this story can help you understand what the users want and how we can help them. So let me tell you the story about the invention of the spreadsheet. Do you guys know this one? Maybe not. A lot of people I talk about don't know the origin of the spreadsheet, and that's what I will tell you today. So please meet the fathers of the spreadsheet, Bob Frankson and Dan Brickley, two colleagues from MIT, and then Dan Brickley went to do a specialization at Harvard um, Business School, and 
uh, I will show you a video about the invention of the spreadsheet. During this video, please increase your volume a little bit as the volume is not very high, and then you can turn it out down just a little bit again. This will be better for your experience. One of the first problems that I ran into was how do you represent values in formulas? Let me show you what I mean. I thought that you would point somewhere, type in some words, then type in some somewhere else, put in some numbers and some more numbers, point where you want the answer, and then point to the first, press minus, point to the second, and get the result. The problem was, what should I put in the formula? It had to be something the computer knew what to put in, and if you looked at the formula, you needed to know where on the screen it referred to. So the first thing I thought was the programmer way of doing it. The first time you pointed to somewhere, the computer would ask you to type in a unique name. It became pretty clear pretty fast that that was going to be too tedious. The computer had to automatically make up the name and put it inside. So I thought, why not make it be the order in which you create them? I tried that, value one, value two. Pretty quickly I saw that if you had more than a few values, you'd never remember on the screen things were. Then I said, why not, instead of allowing you to put values anywhere, I'll restrict you to a grid. Then when you pointed to a cell, the computer could put the row and column in as a name. And if I did it like a map and put ABC across the top and numbers along the side, if you saw B7 in a formula, you'd know exactly where it was on the screen. And if you had to type a formula in yourself, you'd know what to do. Restricting you to a grid helped solve my problem. It also opened up new capabilities, like the ability to have ranges of cells. But it wasn't too restrictive. You could still put any value, any formula, in any cell. And that's the way we do it to this day almost 40 years later. So any value, any way in any cell. So this is exactly what we, uh, what is important about, uh, um, about Excel. So let me just change here a quick setting in my computer for a second. All right, so other point also that is important, uh, let's take a look at the first tool that was built uh, with this system. Come up with was a physical and Calcula calculator. Calculator. The problem I had with Perm Ledger is nobody outside finance would know what a ledger is. But it was a visible calculator the way I thought of it. So it was obvious that visible calculator, VisiCalc. When Apple was going to go public, they couldn't go public until I found the last bug in the Apple V VisiCalc. So I was trying to find this bug and they were waiting. This is a very interesting time because <laughs> Bob was working on the Apple III VisiCalc and the Apple III was the new Apple, the first business version of the Apple they were going to do. And Apple was holding off going public. The I, product, I, I don't have a direct one, but... The, it this. seemed really weird that as soon as we okayed the shipment, when Bob, we finally okayed the shipment, the next day they actually went public. So you see this important of this tool is that it was so important that it was fundamental for the launch of Apple and to go public. So really um, a key product and a key invention that over 40 years after it's still the key concept is still the main one that is used. So any cell uh, uh, representing any data that you want. So this is a powerful concept. It's very different than one we have in Power BI. This invention was so uh, important that, you know, there is a plate in the Harvard Business School in this room. In 1978, Dan Bricklin, MBA 79, conceived the first spreadsheet program. What, what a milestone. Really, congratulations. This is really a, a, a key milestone. Revisiting the history, 2003, you have Excel, this version that you knew before. In 2007 comes the ribbon. Um, where you have all the menus and all the shortcuts more accessible for everyone but taking a little bit of the space on the on the canvas in 2010 power pivot is born inside excel so you have also now the ability to model data and to connect you know different entities and tables and create relationships between them inside excel in 2013 you have power query 
so you, the ability to do a, a ETL and to do data transformation within Excel. So these two things were already born inside Excel. And then in 2015, they were turned into Power BI together. And it was the general availability of Power BI. And, you know, the base concept from the release of 2015 is still the vision that uh, it's very representative today still of what is Power BI in its vision. Introducing Power BI by Microsoft. Power BI is a cloud-based business analytics service, enabling anyone to visualize and analyze data with greater speed, efficiency, and understanding. Get started with Power BI in seconds. Just sign up and you're good to go. Within minutes, you'll see your data in new ways thanks to content packs, pre-built dashboards and reports by popular service providers like Salesforce.com or Google Analytics. And in one dashboard, you'll experience a live 360-degree view of your business. Monitor your data in real time from nearly any device across all major operating systems. Set up mobile alerts to your phone when your data changes and share your reports and dashboards with ease. Drag and drop features enable you to go deeper with your data and explore it in new ways by asking simple questions. No need to learn a new language with Power BI. Easily clean, shape, and model your data to create impactful, shareable reports. Power BI, experience your data. Any data, any way, anywhere. Sign up for Power BI today. So any data, any way, anywhere. This is the vision of Power BI. Let me go back to the presentation. So first thing I want you guys to know is that, well, it's possible to analyze a Power BI data set in Excel. It's exactly the same thing as connecting to an analysis services cube in Excel. You need just to download a plugin to analyze in Excel. It's the package from Power BI service. How do you do it? Well, you go here, you download the analyze in Excel updates, you download it, you get the MSI file, you click on it, you click next, 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 finish, you install it, you're ready to go. Once you have this installed, when you go to your workspace and you select either one of the reports or data sets, you have the option on the ellipsis to analyze in Excel. You will download uh, an XLS file, and when you open it, you have a pivot table uh, model connected to your data that is stored in Azure. So, simple steps to do it. Uh, why do we want to do this process? So, a couple of the things. Uh, first, some of the users really prefer to analyze data in a pivot table format. And why is this? Uh, I give you some common scenarios. Um, first of all, they are much more comfortable. They are using, you know, Excel exists for 40 years. They are very used to this. They are not so used for Power BI. There is a change management process in this. So they prefer to use it in a pivot table format. You can say, sometimes they have the option to do it. Uh, if the self-service BI is activated and you can, and the users can do custom-made reports on top of the certified data sets that are in Power BI. Yes, in that case, they can build, you know, the matrix visuals and everything in, in Power BI that are the same as matrix um, pivot tables in Excel. But sometimes if you don't, don't have the option, that's why they want to export data to Excel and then to analyze in a pivot table because they know how to do it. They don't know how to do it with Power BI. So there is some change management and sometimes they prefer for these two reasons to analyze in a pivot table format. You can also automate some of the normal exports to Excel that are being done to the users. There are multiple reasons why I do it. Sometimes they use data that is in Power BI to ingest it into another system. They have other things on top of it. There are many different reasons. Sometimes we really need to ask why, why, why and get to deep dive into the question. If this is really necessary, we can also do it with this technique that I'm going to show you today. Then, if you want to analyze more than one Power BI data set at the same time, you cannot merge them together inside Power BI Cloud. And in Excel, you can join the data together from these two and compare it and do a couple of things together. So this is another option too. You can also, what we've seen that is the strength of Excel is the granular Excel cell referencing. C2 plus D4, you know, in Power BI, try to do that with X, good luck. It will not be easy. You will need a lot of investment of your time to try to learn it. Other principles can be, for instance, to feed existing reports. I will give you an example today. 
configure some dimensions of lists that are available, but not, but not exactly as you need. I will also give you an example today and general data exploration purposes for many reasons. Let's start first with these four key reasons um, and let's see some examples for it. So let's see a demo on what we can do with this. So first of all, I have here a Power BI report in my desktop. And what I'm going to do is I have already published this Power BI report. I have it here. Yeah. So I have it here and I publish it to the cloud. It's a simple report. Um, if I open and I show you the model, it's nothing too special. I can see here the relationships. I always like to start with this. So you have. You have just a geography table. You have a date table. You have an employee. So you have three main dimensions that are available connected to your sales table here. So very simple model. And then you have also some targets and everything. I have the model already. I can publish it and upload it here in the cloud. And then when I have, I can either access the report here. And now imagine I am the end user and I have the report here and I can access it. So I can do maybe a lot of things and to click, you know, in an employee and see the filter. Okay. But imagine now I want to have a, a list, you know, of my sales by state or my sales by employee, the full list, not just the top three. And I don't have access to edit the report. You know, I need something else to help me doing this and maybe I cannot. That's where Excel comes in also. If you allow that option to the end users. So the user can come here and click either in the report or in the data set of feeding the report, analyze in Excel. When they click on this, it will download the XLS file. You can open it and then you are connected to your model that is stored in Power BI Cloud, which subsequently your analysis services model is stored in Azure. So when you enable your editing, here you are connected to your model, you have a, the, the famous pivot table that the users many times want, and here you have your model. And now I can go and I can drag my total sales to my values. I can pick, for instance, the state, I think, state. I can drag it to my rows, and here it is, and I have my data here. So I'm connected to the model. What is interesting, you know, is how is this data conne get connected from the cube? What I can do is a quick test and I can get my Power BI file here. You see my total sales here. I have a dummy multiplier by two. And what I'll do, I will remove this multiplier. The value will change. This is just the value, you know, from the last two years. So that's why it is different from the Excel. I will save it. And now we'll republish to the cloud and we'll see what happens. So I'll publish this. I'm authenticated with my account. So I have access only to the workspaces that I have access in the cloud. I will publish it. Let's give it a second. I have a couple of things open in my workbook right now. So I'll upload it to my demonstration workspace, my reports. I will replace the existing data set that is stored there. Of course. So now the value of the cells should be replaced. Okay, so my report is published in the cloud, and that means that when I open back here, I have it. You'll see here refreshed today at 14:19 my local time, so one hour afterwards in Germany. So what happens now in the Excel version? So you see here. 396, I divided by two in my model. And I, as I call again my data from my Azure storage, it's refreshed directly because this model, if I go to data queries and connections, you'll see that I'm connected live to the data set stored in Azure. I will go here. Here you have your connection string. I can rename it. Let's give it this name. And the definition here you have the connection string and the model that you're connected to. So simple as that. What I can do is I can do the same thing for another data set, analyze in Excel. You will see, I will open this one too. 
I create another pivot table. Imagine that you have data from different systems uh, coming and being put stored into Power BI, and then you want to compare one to the other. So this is also something that is so simple to do with Excel. So I can go and get the total sales here to my values from my second data set. I can search and I think it's like the state. I can put the country because this one has more countries. I select just United States. OK, and here I have it. And now what I can do is I copy this entire pivot table and I can paste it in my other one and look at what happens. Now inside my model, I have connections to two models so I can change the, this one will be my uh, global superstar, you know. It's just a renaming of the connection and this one I can also rename it. Worldwide well, importance data set. And here you have it, the two together, you know, and then you can do some sort of analytics, for instance, Alabama versus Alabama here and all that. You can sum the two, you can do a lot of different things. So this is the first scenario that I wanted to show you. Also uh, an analytics with pivot tables and also connecting uh, to more than one data set at the same time. What you can also do, I will show you another. I have another data set, uh, another file already prepared here with the connection established to the two. Where do I have it? Let me open my file. So going back to the PowerPoint, what we'll see, we just see this example, what we, uh, how we can do it. We also see this one, analyzing multiple data sets at the same time and taking advantage of the Excel granular referencing. We miss one, which is automating some of the, the exports being done by the users. So let me show you also this one. Here we have an Excel file. So we already did this connection. Now what I want to, um, to do is if I double click on one of these pivot tables and I have here the two connections, Superstar and w Worldwide Importers, if I double click, I get um, a query done to my model. And if I go to the query and I change the query that is behind in feeding this table, not this one here. It's, um, where is it? Data properties here. And I click here in the properties. In the definition, I can change. This is the DAX query sent to my model. So I can change this one, evaluate, for instance, one of the tables, employees. Okay. And if I refresh it, maybe I put the wrong name. Let me try again. Ah. So let me see if I have employee. OK, that was the error. Properties. Employee, evaluate. OK, so here I have the data from the employee table with all the columns that I want. And I can do any other query that I want to, um, to to this data. So this is something also very interesting, automating the exports from the end user. So going back to our uh, PowerPoint, to our presentation. So we already fix these four use cases. It's really powerful and, and uh, complementary, you know, to what we have in, um, in Power BI. Some considerations about this. Um, having access to this feature, and it's the Power BI tenant that can act, uh, enable or not the option to analyze in Excel. You can disable to all the reports in your organization, uh, and maybe uh, or disable to all of them, or just to authorize a few security groups to have access to it. So it's the Power BI tenant that controls this. So some of the considerations that you can uh, do about this is that you need your model to be clean, to be organized with a good naming convention. You also need the explicit measures. Uh, this is basically the, um, if I will show you what I mean with this. This is an implicit measure. It's a default aggregation in Power BI. It's, it's assumed from the type of column. If it's like a test, it, it, uh, text, it will try to do a count or no aggregation uh, or a sum. 
if it's a numerical to try sum, this is a default uh, uh, an explicit measure. I'm explicitly saying to sum the profit column or to sum the sales column or something like that. So these are um, explicit measures. So if you don't have any explicit measures in your model and you try to analyze in Excel, you don't have any measures available and you will not be able to do it. So the fields and tables that are hidden in your uh, model will also not be available when you analyze in Excel. It's obvious, uh, of course, um, and this makes you to consider because if your Power BI report, the one that I've shown you from worldwide importance, just uses 10 fields out of 20 from a fact table, then uh, the other 10 fields, when you analyze it in Excel, they will also be available for you to use. Also, the reports that use them do, do not, are not leveraging those fields. So what you need to consider is the principle of continuity, because if those fields are visible and available for the end users and the analyzing in Excel option is available, someone might be using those fields. And if at any point you want to remove them to make your model lighter and etc., you need to consider these points. So be careful with that. So. Uh, Going back to the demo, what I want to show you also is another example. I have here, um, let me open it up. I have here another report. This is a airport. It's a public report from the data stories galleries that you can download. It's just a report about some flights. And on this report, you see a very nice looking um, dashboard and you see some report tabs here. Everything looks neat and you just see three tabs, you know, and you have the KPIs. The report is very clean, it's very neat, but imagine now you don't have the option to analyze in Excel, all fine. But if you have the option to analyze in Excel and you go here, I have the model open in Power BI Desktop. I could also open it, uh, analyze in Excel. So, and you look at the tables that are behind in the structure of your model. So, you have a table feedback, you have a table July to December. This doesn't make any sense because you need it doesn't exist. You need the date table and then uh, you need the, the dimensions properly stored in dimension tables. Uh, so I don't understand July to December, just a table with a column. Uh, so a lot of crazy things. Imagine a user seeing this and trying to make sense of everything that we have here compared to what we've seen in that report. It looks clean and, uh, and concise. So imagine this analysis in Excel feature is available, it will be very confusing for the users. So just be aware of it if you are on the IT side and may, or on BI professional, be careful with this uh, feature. It's powerful, but you need your models clean when you have this active. So these are some of the considerations. Let's go to another example. Uh, people tables are amazing, a great tool to start analysis. There are some cases where Sometimes we cannot configure them exactly as you want. Take a look at this following example in blue. How can you do something like this with a pivot table? And what I mean by that is you have three measures, sales, profit, and quantity, and you have three years. But I just want the sales shown in all the three years and the profit and the quantity I just care about the last year. So in total, five columns. If I try to, the date is obviously a dimension, so if I um, drag the year from the date and the measures, I will get three multiplied by three, so nine columns automatically. Or the option to, to, to view it in rows, in Power BI, the measures, something like that. But I cannot view it like this. In a pivot table in Excel, the same thing. So how can I build something like this in Excel? Let me show you. What we are going to do is to break um, a pivot table. So what I'm going to do let me just check um, if my connection string here is correct. Properties. OK, so let me go here. I'm not sure if it's this, the good one here. Let me ask a pivot table from worldwide importers. Let me add here a table connected to my model. So what I'll do is I'll place the total sales here and I'll put the state in the rows. Okay, what I'm going to do now is to break this um, and also the year. I'm going to try, I don't know if I have a year field here. Let me check what I have here in my date table. Where is my date? More fields, calendar. Yeah, I have a calendar year here. So I'll put it as a filter and I'll leave and filter one of the years just for us to take a look uh, 2015 to see what happens. Okay, now what I can do 
is go to the analyze within the pivot table tools and go to all app tools and I can convert this to formulas. I can convert also the report filters and this will break my pivot table and now I can drag cells. This is connected to my cube, this cell here, and it gives me the combination of my total cells filtered by the state Alabama and the year 2015. I can delete everything else and now I can manipulate this data cell by cell. If I want to, you know, to change, this is not Alabama, I want it Texas. Let me try it out. You will see the value here, it will change. So the value here changes. Okay, this is awesome and I will explain to you in a minute how this language of the cubes work. So what I'm going to do now is resolve that problem. So I'll copy this. I got the breakdown of a lot of cube members, one, two. So let's solve our problem. First of all, I want to have here not the hard-coded text of Texas, but a cube member of Texas. So, and what I'll do now, I'll paste this at this text, I'll copy this formula, and I'll reference it dynamically based on the text of my cell. So, quotes, and I reference text, and quotes. And I create a cube member for each of these uh, cells here. Let me just delete this one so there is no confusion. Okay, I'll do the same thing for my sales measure. I just got it here, you see, I have a formula to get my sales measure. I will replace it here, 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 here. I already have it here for the profit and quantity. And for my year, I also will do this and I'll explain you what and why in a second. 2015, 2014. Now let's do the magic. Now I'll use a cube value expression, cube value, and I'll do a, a recall of my worldwide importance connection, and I'll use a, a combination of expressions. I want to do the total cells filtered by Texas. I will just fix the, the rows or columns according to, um, to the cells. And this one here, I also want to fix the row. So I get the value for Texas. Total sales, I get it for 2015, 2016, the profit, the quantity, all this, you know, I can just magically create this table and it's dynamic. And if I change, you know, Washington, Washington, my data changes dynamically. So very simple and very uh, powerful to do. So going back to our example, now we know that we can do this. You need to understand a bit the language of the cubes. And what I mean by that, you have three functions. Cube value, which is when you recall a combination of cube members or cube sets. So you can recall a value from your data set of Power BI in Azure, recalling the connection and then a certain number of members or a connection and members or cube sets. A cube set is a, a, a group of cube members. So we need to understand is that you can cross any number of members and sets, but only one measure. And maximum, you can only cross one element of out of each dimension. So for instance, only the category or the subcategory, not the two of them. So if you are using the subcategory, use the more granular one. I will show you an example also in a second about this. So we've just seen how to get independence for the cubes. You can convert in the OLAP tools in the analyze of the pivot table, convert to formulas, and then you can manipulate cell by cell the data that you want to retrieve. And you can use text that is in Excel um, cells to reference dynamically uh, what you want to return from the cube too. So other thing I want to show you is these cube sets. It's um, a group of cube members that can be created by referencing a, um, a number of cube members or a contiguous interval between two cube members. So let me show you what I mean by this. So going back to our example, let's say that I have this following um, scenario. I have a couple of salespeople and I already got the cube member from them. It's like going to the employee table in a pivot table, convert to formulas, copy paste and get the cube member of the, each of the salespeople. What I want to do is a group of salespeople. And now what I'll do is I'll do a cube set. I'll 
tell the name of my connection, worldwide importers, and the expression is just saying, well, these are the co-members I want to join together, and I will call this group as Mr. Johnson. We'll see in a second what will happen. Apparently nothing happens. Uh, we, the, I already have the same thing here for Mr. Smith. Now what I will do, I will reference here this. I could just have copied the formula and put it here. It's the same thing. But when you reference Mr. Johnson, the cell, it will also reference the cube, um, the cube set that you have. And now I can do exactly the same thing as I did um, before. So let me go here. Copy formula. So imagine the following case. Reference this, this, and this. Let's try it out. Co-member, co-member. Okay. Let me try this now. It's getting the data from the cube. Maybe, ah, Mr. Smith is not dynamic, so I'll reference the actual cube set. And you see, I get data from my cube. I can do the same thing for the total. How can I do that? Well, I just don't reference any salespeople. Um, so I just remove this red cell here. And now I do what Excel does best. Um, for instance, I'll give you an example here. Equals this minus of the other two. So you see, it, taking advantage of the formulas in Excel that are very, very simple and very intuitive for the users to do this kind of computation. So another use case using uh, cube, uh, cube sets. So going back to our presentation, you can also adapt this in time. I'll not go into details. You'll have also the presentation available after the session. So why analyze Power BI data in Excel? You've seen already the examples for these four cases. You can also feed an existing report. I've just shown you this example, how to configure dimensions or lists that are available, but not exactly as you need. And also show you how to do data exploration in general. I didn't show you this one, feed existing reports. Let me show you what I mean by this. And what I mean by this is exactly, I imagine I have here um, a report from marketing. And on this report from marketing, I have a lot of data that comes from Google Analytics and uh, stuff like that. And I'm just changing my data from my, for my sales data mart to Power BI. All this data will come from other places, all this, but this KPI here, sales university, will not come. Maybe the revenue or something like that. Well, now you can just get your data from the, the cube that is uh, in a Power BI. So you can do cube value. Exactly what is seen. Worldwide importers and member expression. I can just search for the measures. Quotes. I want from my measures, I want to search for my uh, total sales. Let's take a look what, what happens with this. Ah, I need to change the unit, so I'll divide it because this is in millions. Okay, 198. Let me copy to this cell and let me do the same thing for the previous year. Total sales previous year, because I have a measure in my model with that. And so you see, my report now is connected to the cube. Every time I have to refresh it, I refresh my data. I can refresh, go here and refresh all, and I get fresh data from my Power BI data set in Azure. And my report is feeding. So going back to the presentation, we've seen all these uh, seven examples that uh, are very common in uh, with end users well final one this is not so simple how to make this process more intuitive for the for the end users let me show you a technique about this my suggestion is i usually do a base and we using named ranges and i deliver this to the users and they can create all their custom reports connected to the power bi cube uh, let's see a demo and what i mean by that so as i shown you before I can get, you know, these cube members of Texas, some like, something like that. And I do this for every dimension that I most commonly use in my model. I already did this and I have here a file that I populate, for instance, with the cube member of Texas, the Pennsylvania, and a lot of other things. The measures I use most commonly, the years, the months, some special periods like the last week, last month, stuff like that. What I'll do a technique is that maybe you don't know is you can 
name a range in Excel. For instance, if I name these three cells uh, my sum range here on the top corner, if I give it this uh, named range and then I apply a sum of my name sum range, it will reference the range I have just defined. So this is the way it works. What I can do also is a cell that contains a group member, I can give it an intuitive name, Texas. This one will be called, this one here, sales. This one here will be called year 2016. And this one will be the last one week historic. And this one will be last one week real. Okay, having this ready, I can go and ask questions to my, my data uh, like the following, cube value. Worldwide importers, and now I can cross the different members. I want sales, and I want year 2015, just like that. And it gets me the value from my Power BI data set. Let's do it again. Cube value, worldwide importers, uh, I want profit, and I want 2015, year 2015, and I want Texas. And it gets me the data. If I want to just, you know, this value, uh, I want to, for instance, I give an example. I don't want year 2015. I want Easter of this year. And I want to compare it with the, I don't have value this year, but I have maybe next, last year. So, you know, I can do this kind of uh, analysis and recall periods that I have previously configured and do it side by side in Excel, compared one minus the other, all that kind of things that you can do well in Excel that it's a little bit more difficult to do in Power BI. So the two of them become really great together. So to wrap things up, you need to know that any Excel cell can be assigned a named range, but valid named ranges can only contain letters, numbers, periods, question marks, and underscores. You cannot contain spaces or start by numbers. That's why in the year 2016, I didn't put just 2016. It con cannot contain the letters, uh, uh, start by numbers or contain spaces. Another example here, you know, some store managers want to type just um, a number of a store and get from an entire list of SKUs just uh, the list of the, the cells. So let's see what happens. They type a number of a store. And they just instantly get populated from the cube, the values of stock, sales, uh, anything they want populated in a spreadsheet, getting data from a cube. And now they can do all in any calculation that they want to do. So very simple also to, to do. How does this fit in in the architecture of Power BI? Well, maybe you already know that you can publish data to powerbi.com uh, or also called Power BI service, and then you can analyze it with Power BI. Now what you know is you can also analyze it in Excel. You have the two options together, and uh, this is what I wanted to show you today. The best of the worlds, two options, take advantage of each of them for the, the use case. There are many use cases for one and for the other. Don't try to use one for all the use cases. As takeaway notes, well, Analyzing Excel can be exactly handy according to the maturity of your corporate analytics. What I mean is, if you have self-service BI and the users already know how to use Power BI very well, then you know they can create their custom reports. Maybe they don't need these, some of these features so well. But if you don't have self-service BI activated, maybe this will really help you drive the change and have some availability for the users on some of the things while you actually build all your end reports and the big certified models that you want to build for, for them, and even the power apps and the act, the act uh, options that you want, not only to view the KPIs, but to act on top of them. Huge organizations like Maersk and many others only recently moved from CSV, Excel, a lot of data silos to a tool like Power BI and to Azure. So um, it's very recent. And keep your models clean and concise. Think about the naming convention and what it is to come. If you can deliver any, everything to your stakeholders, on the other way, I mean, um, if they can't be satisfied with everything, you have some options to leverage some of the requests you have. So thank you all for attending today. I hope it was interesting for you, as there are many things that are going to come out in Microsoft Excel online together plugged with Power BI. This is going to, believe me, this is going to be a growing topic, this cellular um, adjustments and matching. You have my contacts, pedroreis81 at gmail.com. 
my blog leadingwithdata.net and also my LinkedIn. Feel free to to connect with me. I would love to 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 share more with you and to hear more about your use cases too. Thank you for having me here today, Frank and Timur. Uh, it was my pleasure.